Well, thanks to everybody at home for joining back in for day five of AP Daily live review for AP Physics 2. Today, we're going to focus on solving some problems in magnetism, some problems direct from the AP Physics 2 exam. Along the way, we'll do a super quick overview of everything you need to know about magnetism. Let's go. Okay, I'm Joe Mancino from Glastonbury High School in fantastic Glastonbury, Connecticut, home of the Guardians, ready to work with you on magnetism. Today, we are almost through the course. You've worked on fluids and thermodynamics, electrostatics, and circuits. After this session, you'll be joining me for light and optics and modern physics. And then finally, Mr. Strauderman is going to put it all together in one grand look back. Now, these are the topics I'm hoping you already know about magnetism. What are the causes of magnetism, the types of magnetism? How does a moving current cause a magnetic field? How does a magnetic field exert forces on wires and on moving charged objects? And what is up with induction and flux? But we're not really going to dive into those topics. Every step of the way, I will mention where you can find more information about those. Because today, oh boy, do we have a lot to work through. We are going to solve AP physics problems. We're going to look at forces exerted on moving charged objects. We'll solve not one, but two paragraph length responses. Please hold your applause. We're going to derive some algebraic expressions and talk about the magnitude and direction of induced current when flux changes. OK. So you do need to know some stuff. Like I said, there'd be a really brief overview. You need to know that an electron's spin causes it to have a magnetic field, that many, uh, many electrons in the same neighborhood with similar spin is called a domain, a collection of magnetic domains that all tend to point in the same direction make a material magnetic. For more of an explanation on how domains align to make a magnet, check out AP Daily Video 1 in Topic 5.1 or last year's AP Daily Live Review. Either way you look at it, you'll need to know that ferromagnetism makes permanent magnets. Paramagnetism, well, materials that exhibit paramagnetism become temporary magnets when there's a magnetic field, but when the field's gone, the magnetism's gone. You also need to know that every material is weakly diamagnetic a little bit repelled by a magnetic field. This mostly discusses uh, the types of magnetism in daily video four in topic 5.5. And that is a nice screenshot if you want a really quick summary. Go ahead and screen grab that. Thumbs up from me. There you go. OK, let's move right along. You need to understand Orsted's discovery in which a current carrying wire was placed in the neighborhood of some compasses. So let's take a top down view of that. There's a, a wire carrying a current uh, in that green wire loop. And now here as a dot in the middle of your screen is that green wire. Orsted discovered experimental evidence that magnetic fields, when we turn the current on, Magnetic fields are created around a current carrying wire, and the placement of those compasses gives us a clue about the shape of the magnetic field. The shape of the magnetic field around a wire is like this. It's defined by a right-hand rule. I'm sure that your teacher worked with you on the right hand rule for the direction of the magnetic field around a wire. And I'm not going to show you mine because I don't want to conflict with what your teacher is showing you. I'm sure that their version is also right. But make sure that you have practiced this and that you're great at it before exam time. Well, not only do you need to know the shape of the magnetic field around a wire, but you need to know how the magnitude of that magnetic field decreases with distance. Notice I've drawn, you know, bold dark lines near the wire and more translucent lines further away from the wire. 
here's the equation that ties it all together. The magnetic field caused by a section of wire that carries some current, by a very long wire that carries current, is related to the current in the wire and inversely related to the distance from the wire. That constant of proportionality shows up again. The magnetic permeability is mu naught, and that's a constant of nature. That 2 pi is in there because of the shape of the very long straight wire. If you'd like some more detail on this, calculating the magnetic field around a long straight wire, guess what? Miss Murray is there to help you out in AP Daily Video 3 in Topic 5.5. Now, I'm going to be referring to the AP Daily videos in last year's review a lot. If you're getting ready for the AP Physics 2 exam, those are a great source of information and practice materials. A skill that you're definitely going to need, though, and we can be sure of this, is first off, identifying the direction of current in a circuit based on the placement of the battery. Now notice the positive terminal of that battery is right there on the bottom. If the positive terminal is right there on the bottom, the negative terminal is up on top, the direction of classical current is away from the positive terminal of the battery. Or in our case, the direction of classical current is counterclockwise. So you have to be able to identify that the current in the red wire is directed upwards. Okay, once you know that the current in the red wire is directed upwards, you'll need to then apply your favorite right-hand rule. My class would call that the thumbs-up right-hand rule, and you may know a similar one to tell you that the magnetic field to the right of that wire is directed away from you, or you might say into your screen, and the magnetic field to the left of the wire is directed towards you, or out of the screen if you're used to using that language. Either way, it's X's on the right, dots on the left if the current is up. Of course, you'll have to be able to do that in any orientation, so make sure that your understanding of the application of your right-hand rule meshes with what you see on the screen. Likewise, you'll need to be able to identify the direction of the magnetic field inside a loop of wire. Here, there's a loop of wire on the left of your screen carrying a clockwise current and making an X magnetic field, an inward magnetic field inside that wire loop. On the right side of your screen, you see a counterclockwise current, a loop of wire carrying counterclockwise current and making an outward dot field. Okay, I hope you're still with me here. Let's talk force you definitely need to understand how to calculate and compare the forces exerted on sections of current carrying wire as they carry current through a magnetic field. Now, I tell my students that the forces BIL sine theta, they love to remember that it's Bill sine theta. Now, I've color-coded everything here so you know what B, I, L, and theta are. But if you look at the AP Physics 2 equation sheet, you'll notice that uh, magnetic force is ILB. And it doesn't say in the first line ILB sine theta, but it says it right there in the bottom, ILB sine theta. You also need to understand not only the force exerted on a wire and the field created by a current carrying wire, you need to understand the magnetic forces exerted between two current carrying wires. When two current carrying wires are near each other, they exert force on each other. Now, just like any two things that exert force on each other, the force exerted on wire one by wire two forms a Newton third, uh, Newton's third law pair with the force exerted on wire two by wire one. If you see a question asking you to compare those forces, remember, they're an equal and opposite Newton's third law pair. But that's not going to tell you the direction of the force. You need to work out that if the currents are in the same direction, the magnetic force is attractive. And if the currents are in opposite directions, the magnetic force is repulsive. Now, I know that can be a lot to handle. So my good friend, Ms. Mosley, explains it brilliantly in AP Daily Video 3 in Topic 5.6. You should definitely watch that video. 
Okay, finally, if you'd like to understand the relationship uh, between the electric force exerted on a moving charged particle and the magnetic force exerted on a moving charged particle, and you know the kind of questions I'm talking about, well, watch as Ms. Murray explains it brilliantly in AP Daily Video 3 and 4 in Topic 5.7, and I take it on last year in the AP Daily Live Review. I'm skipping past this. We're not even getting into it. There are so many resources out there comparing magnetic forces and electric forces that if you'd like to review that content, check out those resources because we are going to practice a problem. So buckle up. Here we go. In this situation, a particle with a positive charge labeled positive Q is traveling with constant velocity V to the right. The particle is approaching this region, uh, the shaded region shown by that dashed box, and that region contains a uniform field. And in the course of this problem, we change the field that's in the box a couple of times, so I didn't draw the field in just yet. The particle is so light that the effects of gravity are negligible, and it'll always say that you can ignore gravity when you can ignore gravity. So we're going to figure out what the effects of those different fields might be. The first field that we're going to take a look at is a downward electric field. All right, so there's a downward electric field in that box, and this positively charged particle is approaching from the left. So I'm going to give you a moment here. Just predict it. Maybe trace it out with your finger. Point at your screen. You may have to draw this on the AP Physics 2 exam. Now is a good time to practice. If this positively charged particle, this positively charged object, were to move into an electric field in this way, what might its path look like? You have something in your head? You have a guess? All right, here we go. Here's how I drew it. That's what I think that path would look like. There are three important things I'd like you to know about this path, three important pieces of the story, the before, the during, and the after. Before the particle entered the field, well, there was no force, so there was no acceleration. The velocity was constant. That's constant speed and constant direction. But when that charged object entered the field, the electric field exerted a downward electric force on that positively charged object. The force, uh, the electric force exerted on it is in the direction of the electric field. And the direction doesn't change. The direction doesn't depend on the velocity of the object. Once the object left the region of electric field, there was no force. So again, it traveled in a straight line. That line only curves, and it only curves downward in the region of electric field outside of the region there is no curvature. It's just a straight path. So there's the summary. Outside the field, there is no force. There is no acceleration. When a charged object experiences electrical force, the force, the acceleration, are in the direction of electric field. But remember, I said that box might have a different kind of field later in the question. In this case, oh, you guessed it. It's an outward magnetic field coming right at you. And you know that because those are dots. OK, so what I'd like you to think about now is what that path is going to look like if the charged object moves through the magnetic field. It enters the field with that same constant velocity v. What happens while it's in the magnetic field? All right, here's my artistic rendition of what happens. I think it's something like that. So here's what's different about those two paths. Certainly outside of the field, there's nothing different. If there's no magnetic force, there's no magnetic, there's no acceleration if there's no force. But when the object is in the region of magnetic field, the force is exerted perpendicular to the velocity of the object and perpendicular to the magnetic field. There's still constant speed but now there's centripetal acceleration. OK, when the particle, again, leaves the magnetic field, there's no force and there's no acceleration. 
So let's take a grand zoom out at that. Let's look at this path that the particle takes in the magnetic field when it's in the field. The result of magnetic force is to make it move in a curved circular path. I made sure to trace part of a circle with my path. It's not just accelerated downward. Because notice that green arrow is down and to the left. It's accelerated perpendicular to its velocity, and that's the recipe for circular motion. All right, finally, and I'm sure you saw this coming, we're going to mix two kinds of field and look at the effects of doing that. There's an upward electric field, but there's not just one field. There's also that outward magnetic field from before. Now, in this question, we're going to upgrade from just a positively charged particle to a coherent beam of protons. That just means a lot of particles. And they're all moving at different speeds. OK, so here's the story right now. There is a beam of positively charged particles moving at many different speeds. There is a, an upward electric field and an outward magnetic field. And the result of all of this is some of those protons leave the region of field here at point one at the right side. Notice it's towards the top. Some of them leave at point two down there at the bottom. Well, when this question was on the AP Physics 2 exam, here was the question in a coherent paragraph length response. Explain why some protons exit the region at point one and other protons exit at point two. Use physics principles to explain your reasoning. Now we need to unpack these instructions. Remember, there aren't that many different question types and making a physics argument in this form is definitely an important piece of the puzzle. So what do we mean by coherent? Well, a coherent response is one that doesn't contradict itself. It's one that stays on topic. It's one that doesn't just repeat the same idea over and over. It's a series of logically linked statement, statements that get you through uh, some physics evidence from the situation, some physics reasoning, understanding the laws of physics that always hold true, and weaving those together to make a claim to answer the question. To do all of that requires something to be paragraph length. Now, paragraph length doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking for perfectly grammatical sentences. It's OK to use uh, improper grammar. We're not judging you on your spelling. We're not counting periods. But it has to be enough independent, different, linked, on-topic ideas that you've said something. All right. So our job is to explain why some protons leave at point one and some protons leave at point two. Let's think about this a moment. What are the directions of the forces exerted on the protons in this proton beam? Well, from the previous two parts of this question, we've definitely established that the magnetic force is downwards. What about the electric force? The electric field is directed upwards in this situation. And I know that the direction of the force exerted on a positively charged particle by an electric field is in the direction of the field. And that was a piece of the reasoning that uh, folks were looking for when the readers scored this question. They were hoping you'd make some statement relating the direction of those forces. When the protons enter the field initially, the electric force is directed upward and the magnetic force is initially directed down. Now, those forces affect different protons differently. Like I said, the protons enter with different velocities. But electric force, as you remember from working with Mr. Strotterman, only depends on the electric field and the charge of the particle. Well, every proton is identical. So like you learned with Mr. Strotterman, the electric force on a proton depends on field and charge. It's going to be the same for every proton. 
But the magnetic force on a proton, well, it does depend on the magnetic field and it does depend on the charge, but it also depends on the velocity. Magnetic force is a velocity dependent force and magnetic force is downward. So magnetic force is greater for the faster protons. Protons that are moving at a higher speed experience more magnetic force. F equals QVB after all. Okay, so we need to sum all of this up. To sum all this up and tie it together, I can make the claim that slower particles exit at point one and faster particles exit at point two. The slower particles feel less magnetic force, the faster particles feel more magnetic force, and I've established uh, the direction of those forces. And that's it. That is a solidly good answer that makes enough different points and doesn't waste a lot of words. The readers are not looking for an essay. They're not looking for a novel. They're not looking to see what an amazing writer you are. And I'm sure that you are. A scientific argument is succinct. It's self-contained. So let's keep going. Let's practice a little bit more looking at the forces exerted on moving charged objects. And I'm hoping you've seen a diagram like this one before. Okay, there are a lot of words here. I'll give you a moment to skim through. My hope is that you've seen questions like this before. A particle with unknown charge and mass is moving in the area between two charged plates and that area also contains a magnetic field. So there's an electric field and a magnetic field that it moves through with constant velocity for some reason. We'll get to that in a sec. And then it passes through just an area of magnetic field. So in this question, there are already some things we need to be thinking about. First of all, which plate is positive or negative? We weren't told that in the prompt. We're going to have to sort that out. We'll have to sort out what is the direction of the electric field. We're also going to need to think our way through why the velocity of these charged particles is constant when they're moving through the electric and the magnetic field at the same time. Now, it's important to notice that when there's no electric field and the particles are moving to the right, they turn downward. All right, let's look at our first clue. And our first clue is the way the battery is drawn on the left side. Remember I mentioned you have to know which side is positive and which side is negative. Notice that top part of the battery diagram is the longer part. The longer part uh, represents the battery's positive terminal. So we know that the top plate is positively charged and the bottom plate is negatively charged. Therefore, the electric field between the plates generally points down. And that's going to be really important for our analysis of this question. The second question that we have to consider is what is the direction of the magnetic force when the particles enter this field? just the magnetic field. Well, the magnetic force is initially down. And I know that because the curvature is down. All right, so we've drawn in our electric field lines. The first question that we need to answer, the first question that was on uh, this item on a released exam is to explain why the particle moves through the parallel plates undeflected. Why does it move with constant velocity in the same direction. Um, in terms of the forces exerted on the particle, and that's a good clue, there are two forces exerted on the particle. So as a brilliant AP physics student, I know you're thinking the electric field and the magnetic field exert forces of equal magnitude in opposite directions. And if the only two forces exerted on an object are 
equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, well, there's no net force, there's no acceleration. And that explains why the particle moves straight. Now that we've explained that, we need to use all of these clues to figure out the sign of the charge on the particle, just knowing that it moves in a straight line. Well, for that, I'm going to use the clue that I have uh, highlighted in green on the right, that the magnetic force is initially downward. When the magnetic field is away from me and into my screen, and the curvature is downward, if the magnetic force is downward, when the particle's velocity is rightward, and the magnetic field is inward, however your teacher likes to use the right-hand rule that relates the velocity, magnetic, uh, the velocity of a charged object, the magnetic field through which it moves, and the force that the object experiences, use that one. What you'll notice is that you get a uh, a downward force would mean a negatively charged object. If you're not sure how to figure that out, bring this question to your physics teacher and ask, how would I know that the object is negatively charged? It does not obey the right-hand rule for positive charge, so we know it's negative. Okay, the next question involved a lot of text to sort through. And if you see a big block of text with lots of numbers in it, it can be easy to panic. You only have a short period of time, and I know what it feels like to take a timed, stressful physics test. So we're going to take it piece by piece. My high school physics teacher was really smart. And she told me that if I get nervous and overwhelmed and startled when I see a question like this, I can start writing down whatever I want directly on the diagram. I can pull relevant information out and slap it right down on the diagram. So let's do that. I'm going to write some little notes for myself and for you on the diagram. The first one I see is that this magnetic field has a magnitude of 0.3 Teslas. So I'll just write that down. I also see that the, uh, the distance between the plates is just five millimeters. So I'm going to write that down. Write it right on the diagram. I'm told that the magnitude of the charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and that the speed of the charged object is 2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. I'm also told the diameter of this circular path. Now, notice. I know that I mix up radius and diameter when I'm in a hurry. And I bet some of you do too. So when I see a diameter statement, I just write that 2R equals whatever the diameter is. So I don't flip flop it later. Okay, now that I've written all of the data from that block of text, I don't need to look at it again. I have all the useful information with just, uh, just a handful of notes to myself. The first part of the prompt was to derive an algebraic expression for the potential difference that must be applied to produce the motion of the undeflected particles. Now, there is a lot there, but I want to focus on that very first verb. It says derive. Derive means we're going to start with an equation from the AP Physics 2 equation sheet. We're going to use a lot of physics knowledge and turn that into something else. So. It would be great if there were an expression for the potential difference between two parallel plates. If I know the electric field between them uh, and the separation distance, and there is. Because electric field is the, uh, the, the distance rate of change of potential, or E equals V over D, or V equals ED, it's a great place to start. So the first thing I know is that the potential difference is electric field times the separation distance, but also because the particles move straight and undeflected, I can write that the electric force is equal to the magnetic force. Well, I know that the electric force is charge times electric field and magnetic force is QVB. Those are just the expressions for uh, electric force and magnetic force. And now uh, you Algebra lovers out there are thinking divide by Q, and there goes Q. So 
I have now an expression for the electric field in terms of information I already know. And I have an expression for the potential difference, but I don't know the electric field. So I can plug it all together. I can take this electric field equation, use it here, and get that last equation on the bottom. The potential difference is calculable with information that I already have, which in fact was the next prompt on the test to calculate a numerical value for the potential difference. Well, we can use that equation that we just derived. We know the velocity of the particles, we know the magnitude of the magnetic field, and we know the separation distance. So we can say the potential difference is 3,000 volts. Nicely done. The second part that we have to derive an algebraic expression for is by analyzing the circular motion, we want to derive an algebraic expression for the mass of the particles. Well, we know that when a particle is moving through a magnetic field uh, in a direction where it, its velocity is perpendicular to the field, it moves in a circle. So magnetic force causes that mass to accelerate centripetally. Now that's Newton's second law. When something's moving in a circle, we can replace that centripetal acceleration expression with V squared over R. We can replace the magnetic force expression with QVB. So QVB causes MV squared over R, or magnetic force makes the massive particle spin in a circle. All right. But we weren't asked for that exact expression. It does say an expression for the mass of the particle. So we want to start m equals. All right, so algebra cadabra, there it is. We've solved for m. And now we'll use our expression for m to get a numerical value for m. I'll plug in the values that I know. I know the charge. I know the magnitude of the charge. I know the. Uh, I know the magnetic field is 0 0.3 Teslas. I know um, the radius, uh, there it is, is 0 0.21 meters. Remember, I was worried about the radius to diameter flip, so I labeled it 2R equals 42 centimeters. All right, so we put it all together and get ourselves an, uh, a number for the mass. Now, I do want to point out, I remembered to put units. You should, too. Somewhere on the AP Physics 2 exam, there's a point for using correct units with numerical calculations. OK, the last piece of this question is that a student wants to use this apparatus to separate different species of carbon, uh, different isotopes of carbon. There's some carbon-12 and some carbon-14. Well, we need to uh, talk about how those ionized carbon atoms move through both regions of this apparatus. So first, if they are all, uh, notice this phrase says singly ionized atoms. That means they all have the same charge. And that charge is going to be uh, plus or minus the charge of one electron, plus or minus one fundamental charge. Well, because they all have the same ionization and they all have the same speed, uh, if they move through straight, they all have the same speed. So if these particles move straight through that field, that first section, we know they all have the same speed. Once they leave with the same speed, they enter that region of magnetic field. And that's where things get a little weird. The magnitude of the charge does not affect their path through the overlapping fields. The mass of the particle does not affect their path through the overlapping fields. But in the region that only contains magnetic field, well, since carbon-14 is heavier, it travels in a circle with greater radius. And we can see that from the equation that we derived for mass. Mass is linear with radius. So a curve of wider radius is our clue that the particle had more mass. 
take a look at the question, take a look at the answer, and make sure you understand how particles can move through overlapping electric and magnetic fields in a straight line if their velocity is just right, and how they curve through only a magnetic field, and how their curvature depends on the strength of the field, the speed of the particles, the mass of the particles, and the charge of the particles. OK, one quick review of some important induction concepts, and we'll move right on to, you guessed it, another question about induction this time. OK, uh, the first thing to know is that when a, and notice this is a neutral conducting object. There are just as many pluses and minuses. When it moves through a magnetic field, a charge separation is induced. Now, that charge separation is totally not drawn to scale, but you notice there's more negative up top. The top part of the bar is negative, and the bottom part of the bar is positive. So the top part has low potential. The bottom part has high potential. Well, those different potentials mean there is a potential difference, because that's what potential difference is. And that potential difference, that EMF, that script E, depends on the magnitude of the magnetic field, the length of the bar from top to bottom, and the speed with which the bar moves through the field. Now, that can be a lot to remember. So you guessed it. Check out the AP Daily videos about induction. If that rod were connected to some rails and a resistor, uh, it would cause EMF. It would cause current. It would cause a delta V. And that delta V divided by R makes charge flow. It makes current. It's important to know that as this bar moves to the right in this magnetic field, there are forces exerted on the charges within the bar. Now, I'm going to answer this for a positively charged object, even though I know they don't actually carry current. But I know that classical current is the motion of those hypothetical positive charge carriers. So for a positively charged object located right there that is moving to the right in this outward magnetic field, I know that it's going to experience a downward force. My right-hand rule tells me that. So if that positively charged particle is pushed downward through the bar, I can follow its motion all the way around and see that it's going to form part of a clockwise current. All right, you also need to know the idea of magnetic flux. Flux is defined as uh, magnetic field dot the area that it goes through, or magnetic field times the area that it goes through times the cosine of the angle between them. And if you're a little fuzzy on why it's cosine, ask your teacher about the direction of that wacky area vector. When the magnetic field is going through the fully wide open area, there's a lot of flux. And if it goes through the area side on, well, there's not a lot of flux. You also need to know about Lenz's law. Now, Lenz's law tells us the direction of the induced current based on how much the flux is changing. When the magnetic flux through a loop of wire changes, a current is induced in the wire. That induced current also creates its own flux. The flux created by the current will be opposite the direction of the change in flux that caused it. And that's a lot to understand. Now, you may have to answer that graphically. You may have to say that when the flux through a loop of wire is constant, like right here, when the flux through a loop of wire is constant, the induced EMF is 0. When the flux through a loop of wire is changing at a constant rate, the induced EMF is constant. Notice here, even though there's lots of flux, it's not changing. It's 0. So the induced EMF would be 0. And here, where the flux is changing at a constant rate, the EMF is again constant. The induced EMF is the negative slope 
of the graph of flux as a function of time. OK. Let's practice. Practice? But wait, that was really fast. And one of the toughest topics in all of physics. It's going to be OK. If you'd like someone to slow that down for you, Ms. Mosley does a great job explaining this. Her explanation of flux is fantastic. I know my students were really helped by it. So check out AP Daily videos 3 and 4 and 5 in Unit 5.8. And check out last year's AP Daily live review video, because we have a problem to solve. In this problem, a rectangular loop, a rectangular conducting loop, um, is, is moved at constant speed v into a magnetic field. And here it is at three separate times, t1 and t2 and t3. The magnetic field is zero outside the region, and there's an inward magnetic field in that region. All right, I'm hoping you've seen this story before, because your job is to, in, of course, a coherent paragraph length response, compare the following things. The magnitude and the direction of the current at times t1, t2, and t3. Include an explanation of why there is or is not a current. So we're not just comparing the current where it's more or less. We're saying if there's not current, we have to explain why there's not. And if there is a current, we have to explain why there is. We also have to explain the direction of the induced current if there is one present. Now, it reminds us to use fundamental physics concepts and principles in our explanation. All right. That's a lot. That's a lot to do. In these paragraph length responses, you're expected to take some time to think, to digest the question that you were just asked. And I know that if I had to do this, I would underline or, or note the things I knew I had to do. So here's the note I would write to myself. Compare the magnitude and direction at times t1 and t2 and t3 of that induced current. Explain why there is or isn't a current at t1 and t2 and t3. And explain the direction of the current, if there is one, at t1 and t2 and t3. All right. I think I understand the question. I hope you understand the question. Let's try to answer it. First off, let's talk about T1 and T2. At T1 and T2, the flux through that loop of wire is changing. And because the flux is changing, because the wire is overlapping the area of this field by more and more and more, there's going to be a current induced in the loop. But at time T3, the loop is moving through the field, but the flux isn't changing. The whole loop is already full of field and continues to be full of field. So there's no change in flux, no induced current. So at times T1 and T2, there is current, and the current is counterclockwise. Well, let's explain why those things happen. Remember, the prompt is explain why there's current and why it's in that direction. There is a current because the flux is changing. The direction of the current can be answered either using Lenz's law. The x inward flux is increasing, so the induced current has to make dot outward flux. OK, that tells me it needs to be a counterclockwise current. Or you can answer in terms of the forces exerted on the charge carriers in that wire. Now, I just did an example where I talked about the force on a positive charge. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the force on a negative charge. The magnetic field exerts a downward force on negative charges, which would mean a clockwise electron flow or a counterclockwise classical current. I wanted to make sure to mention that difference somewhere in this review. OK, finally, I'm going to say that at T3, the flux isn't changing, so there's no current. 
That's it. That's a great paragraph length response. Now let's make sure that we've answered all parts of this question. Well, did we compare the magnitude of the current at all three times? Because we got to double check that we've answered the question. And yeah, uh, it has the same magnitude at T1 and T2, and there's no current at T3. All right, great. I've compared the magnitude. Did I explain why there is or isn't a current at those times? Well, there's current because, uh, and then the flux is not changing. So I, I feel like I must have said that. I've mentioned why there is current at one and two and why there's not current at three. And I've also explained the direction of the current at times T1 and T2, and there's no current at T3. So when you tackle a paragraph length response question, go back and make sure that you've achieved all of your goals. You've used evidence from the diagram, evidence from the situation. You've used good physics reasoning. Here, uh, I've employed the right hand rule. I've talked about changing flux. I've used some good physics reasoning, so I've made a claim. I've answered the question. If you'd like a better explanation of flux, a more detailed explanation of flux, and a real cool 3D print, check out Ms. Mosley, an absolute physics master. Really in all of Topic 5.8, if you're a little fuzzy on flux, Topic 5.8 is the place to be. So what's today's take-home message? What do you need to know about? Well, you need to know about the forces exerted on moving charged objects how electric forces are different from magnetic forces. Did we do that? You bet we did that. You need to write paragraph length responses. You'll need to do one on the AP Physics 2 exam. Did we write one? We sure did. And yeah, we wrote two, because we're awesome. Did we derive any algebraic expressions by starting with something from the equation sheet and turning it into something else? Heck yeah, we did. Finally, did we look at the magnitude and direction of induced current? Well, we definitely did. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for coming. I can't wait to work with you tomorrow as we talk about optics. Uh, and then finally, as we talk about uh, as we talk about modern physics. So it's been a blast. You've got the AP Physics 2 exam coming up. Best of luck, everybody, and I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you all very much.